Hello Cinematic Nation and welcome to Simply Cinematic Live, a YouTube live video series concentrating on key features and functions of the Cinematic Control as well as a lot of tips and tricks that will really apply to any CNC. I'm your host Chris Pollack and this is our Virtual Technical Application Center. So before we begin, I just want to give you guys an update. This is kind of a bittersweet for me. I am uh, currently going to be hosting our last YouTube Live event. Now, not the last Cinemark Live by any means, but from this facility or location. We've had the uh, privilege and the, uh, really the, the, the privilege and the experience to be able to be here at this location. We are actually at the manufacturer, the OEM of this machine tool, Fryer Machine Systems, and this is where our studio has been for the last year. However, we always kind of knew this was going to be a temporary scenario, and we have now finally moved forward and are going to be building our own permanent studio. So with that being said, stay tuned for some, certainly some new episodes coming up. There's going to be a little bit of a time lag while we build the studio, transition the machine over into there. So probably a couple months till we're back up online, but keep looking out for it, keep checking the channel. And again, as always, if you guys like this content, please remember to like it, share it, and certainly follow the channel. That's going to be the best way for you guys to keep up to speed on the new content we have coming down the pike. But now let's get into the real material, or really the reason why we're here. So we've done, this is the third of a three-part series talking about right angle aggregate heads. Um, the first, intentionally the first video was just a basic overview, kind of giving everybody the overall capabilities of using right angle heads and, and how to set them up and somewhat commission. Part two got really deep into the actual commissioning or the back end setup of the head. And today I want to spend some time from an operation and programming perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the whole process of setting up this machine and even do a little light programming exercise of how to use a right angle head. So first we're going to start with setting up the machine tool. So for this case and this example, I want to work from a center datum location and the top of my part. So previously I had done this um, prior to you guys seeing the setup. Here we're going to do the whole process. So I'm going to go to the control and I'm going to select my probe. This machine I happen to have a Marpos 3D probe that I can use for part setup. So we'll do a tool change, grab up this probe. Just validating the spindle is empty. And now let's come over and set our zero. So I'm going to be working from, as I said, the middle of my block. So with a probe, all I have to do is get my part somewhere close, and then we can go through a measuring cycle. Now, why am I setting up the part first at this point? Well, I need a datum surface for me to be able to set the right angle head to. Now, certainly if I had a tool probe set up, which on this machine I do, I just don't happen to have it installed right now, then I could just use that and really not need to set up the physical part. But for our case, I'm going to use this top surface as my datum location. Now it's important when we're setting up these parts in this datum location, when I use right angle heads, I have to adopt what we refer to as a positive tool length offset strategy. That means that the tool length is not a distance from machine home or machine reference, which would be the top of the machine's travel, but it's actually a distance from a gauge line or a spindle face to the tool tip. So for argument's sake, if you were to take a look at this probe, and I go to my tool list, and I look at the offsets of the probe, you would notice that I have a five, just less than a five and a half inch dimension on this probe. So what we're doing is we're establishing the top of the part, and that's going to be a value set in our work coordinate system. So we do that by going to our jog area. We're going to use our measure workpiece functionality. And we're going to come in and we're going to find the axes or the system in three dimensions. We're going to see it, find it in Z and then X and Y. Now Z, I'm just going to do a basic edge kick. Tell it the work coordinate that I want to write to and what I want the top of the part to be from the setup when I'm done. And this is important because when I come back and set up the right angle head, we're going to be touching off to that datum. At this point, we can cycle start the machine. That's going to activate the probe. The machine's going to start feeding down at a predefined rate, find the top of my part, establish our first zero. 
Now, to do my X and Y location, I could go through and use a cycle to edge kick every edge independent, or I can use, we have a feature within the control that allows me to handle rectangles or bosses, an irregular shape, but a rectangular style shape. And I just come in and really tell it where I want to write the offset, some rough dimensions of the block, how far down I want to send the probe for each measurement, and what I want to consider the center of the part where I'm done. Now, the Z measurement is going to be based on roughly where the machine is sitting. So I'm now telling it move down a half an inch from this location right here. So she's actually going to move down a little bit more than that. And now we'll go around and find the center of our block or a rough stock. So this cycle will really allow me to take four measurements working around the part. And when it's done, it will also establish the center to be really whatever I put in this data field. So in our case, I put 0, 0, so that's what we're going to treat the center at. Now, had I had a right angle head where it was fixed in a 90 degree orientation, then in that case, I may want to set up a temporary datum to an edge of the part to allow me to then touch off to that edge. Or I would just have to compensate for half of the width of the part when I touch off to that orientation position. So we're almost done. She's coming in and taking our next measurement here on the front of our part. And now it's a, a Y measurement in the plus direction. And then the last one is going to be a Y in the negative direction. And when it finishes, it's going to return to the center of the part and our display should read zero, zero. Now once we've done this, we'll have a datum. And then we can actually turn on what we refer to as the swivel cycle or our cycle 800. And that's what manages the right angle head. So it was important to note throughout this whole measurement process, I did not have the swivel cycle turned on. That only gets turned on when I have the right angle head in place. So everything is now set up. I could put the tool away at this point or I can wait until I tool change to the probe. So we're going to wait until we tool change to the probe. So our, our next step would really be creating the tool. And last time I had the tool already created, but now we're going to show you how we actually build a tool in the library. So what I want to do is I want to transition over to our offset screen by hitting the hard offset key button, or I can use the soft key on my screen that refers to parameters. Either one will place me over to the offset area. Now when I deal with large heads like this, I probably can't have it sitting in the machine's tool changer. Um, just for weight reasons, it certainly is pretty heavy of a head. Um, obviously in a smaller machine like this, if I had a much larger machine, you could certainly tool change this. So what we're going to do in the Cinemaric control is we have the ability of creating tools in what we call an unloaded state. So those are all these tools that don't have any location numbers next to them. You know, if you looked up previous to this, you see there's numbers. Those numbers correlate to the pockets of the tool changer. So my probe is going to go back into pocket 8. There's a little green indicator you might be able to see there. But for our right angle head, we're going to come down and we're going to build it down in an unloaded state. Now, just like building any tool, I'm going to go to new. And this is really where adopting the cycle 800 function really shows you its capabilities. So historically, if I was going to create a right angle head that was commissioned in a Cinemaric, I would have to go to cutters and I was limited to really only tool def two definitions. I could do an angle head cutter or an angle head cutter with some kind of radius or corner round. But at, at anything beyond that, and I was limited to that geometry of tool. Once you use the swivel cycle to manage this physical tool, now I can choose any tool I want. So if I'm going to build a drill, I go to drill. If I'm going to build an end mill, I go to end mill. If I want to build a tapered end mill, maybe a tapered die mill, you can do that through this function. And I can pick any tool in the library. So in our case, we're going to pick a twist drill. I say OK. Now it gave me my basic naming feature was turned on on this control. So that's OK. I'm going to say it's a drill. And we're going to say it's a 3 8 drill. And then I want some reference for myself to know that maybe this is my, my right angle head. So in this case, I'm going to call it the AGU90 for the big Kaiser head. Um, and then you could certainly keep creating more text than that. Hit Enter. And now we're going to eventually set a tool length, but that length's going to come in when we touch off the tool. And I do want to tell it the diameter and the tip angle of the drill, only if I'm really compensating for them. 
Once the tool's built, we can now do a tool change and load up the head. Now this one obviously had been previously commissioned, so this is really just from the perspective of an operator slash programmer. So we're just gonna set up, select the drill, cycle start. Machine's going to put away my tool. I'm going to a clearance position. And then it's gonna prompt me to do a manual tool change. So I can issue a cycle start. Now it's up to me to remember to put the physical tool in. I'm just giving myself a little clearance because we're gonna come over here, grab our right angle head, and install it. So the orientation position was all set up in relation to this datum block. So I can come in and drop it in. I wanna make sure she locked in place. And now my head is in the spindle. So let's transition over to a different view here so you guys can see. So we, we put the head in, it's now in position. It's really now time that it's physically in the spindle to align it, to set it up. Now, initially, maybe I was gonna do something in this orientation, we would align it here, but I wanna show you how to do a more complex alignment first, and then we'll go back and get it set up here. So let's say I was going to set up for this angle hole that I did originally. So I'm just gonna move the machine, the table over just a little bit here for us. Right, so we have an angle hole that was in this position. Give you a little bit of perspective here. A little hard for you to see. So that angle hole is sitting at a 315 degree orientation and 45 degrees. So if I was gonna set up this tool to be able to do that, what I would first do is put some kind of standard into my collet. So here we have just a piece of ground stock. And we're gonna just snug that up in the collet. And then later we'll go back and put our physical tool in. Now, when it comes to managing this tool, I'm then going to use the swivel cycle to actually manage the orientation. So if I wanted to set up this head on a two, degree, you know, two orientation angle, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to first set my 315 degrees. Because my 45, that's going to be controlled by this scale right here, which is actually quite accurate. Now, if I had to do something that wasn't perfect to a one degree increment, because this system only allows me to get one degree at a point, then I would have to do the indication just like I'm indicating for my C or my rotation about the spindle. It's important here to drive the system now with our tool carrier. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna put my angle of rotation and hit cycle start. And now the system prompts me to now move the head to this rotation angle. And the way you move these heads is you're just going to loosen up these two bolts on this collar. And now once that's loose, let me grab that. Hold on one second. There we go. Once that's loose, I can use this bar and I can rotate this head around. So I'm positioning it to the 315 degrees. I'm gonna need an indicator here indicator's going to allow me to align it. Getting old, so i got to use my cheaters. So let's pop them on. Hold that. So what I want to do is I want to preset it somewhere as close as I can get on this scale. But as you can imagine, that scale is probably not accurate enough for what we're doing. So now we're going to indicate this. Now, by establishing this orientation with the swivel cycle, I can let the system track this orientation. So initially, I'm gonna get this down, oh, finish my cycle start for my rotation. We're gonna bring the head down into position and get the machine somewhat close. Give myself a little bit of travel. Now, what I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna to wanna to set my indicator up perpendicular to the measured surface that I'm going to do. So here you see I'm setting it at a rough angle. And the next step is to zero out my indicator. So we're gonna bring the Z up. Now currently, I have the machine moving around based on the machine coordinate system. So you see how I'm not moving around relative to that orientated angle. If you select the WCS function, now either the hand wheel or the joystick will now track relative to this surface. So it makes moving it around a lot easier, but more importantly, when I start to indicate this in, I can indicate it in 
on any orientation position. So I just want to bump the indicator just a little bit. Now I'm going to move up and down my z-axis to find the high spot of my bar. And that's just getting me on center of the bar. And now we can move and track this. And boy, I think I got super lucky today. I bring it to roughly zero. And I want to run right up and down. And look at that. Boy, we are a lucky day. So normally this would not be perfect. So then I would adjust my orientation back or forth to get her in. I just dropped my air hose. Don't worry about that. Then from there, we would now orient to the next location. So let's say we were there. We could snug up these two positions. Now I'll just give it a little bit there. Okay. And now we can set our next angle. And then this one should come right in based on the head. But, a, but of course, I'm going to set it to a 45 degree angle. If I needed something other than a one degree increment, then I can come in and I can set it. And I can't really see this, so I'm going to do this on the bench real fast. But I want to show you guys how to actually set it up on a full compound angle. So what we'll do is we'll take this head and we're going to bring out our zero degree point. The zero degree allows us to lock it in place. I'm going to adjust the head down to 45 degrees. And I'm doing this from the scale right on the front of the head. And then we're going to bring in the five degree detent. And that's what's going to bring it right into this orientation. Okay. So now, if I put this head back in the spindle, All right, so the head's in a defined angle. I want to now establish this angle right through the swivel cycle. So again, I'm using the same swivel cycle we used to do the original orientation. We hit cycle start, prompts me, and now the system is going to move relative to this orientation angle. So I could bring her down, Move it up, and I'm just going to come down right onto the indicator. Just like I did before, I could certainly find my high spot, but now I can actually track this orientation angle even at a compound angle. So you can see we can track or indicate at any orientation, and I would probably move my indicator to be square. Now for our job, we're going to work on this surface. It makes just visualizing and seeing things a little bit easier. So now we're going to do one final adjustment and set everything back up. So I'm going to put my 180 degree orientation back at zero. Cycle start prompts me and let's spin it around. Okay. So loosen up your bolts. And I can do the orientation angle, and you have a better view of the camera. So let's swing her around. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, I'm gonna grab my cheaters again here. I see my buddy Don is watching. Don, how you doing? It's great to see you. All right, so I'm setting her back to zero, and I'm gonna put the, the head back to its zero degree orientation because I need to square it up. And this is where, when you use a head like this, if I needed to do different orientations on the same job, if I'm prototyping, I can get away with one head, and I can certainly change this orientation, change my setup, and just do that feature. But if we were gonna really come in and do some production, then I would probably need a second head to keep me from having to change it during setup. And then I could just tool change between these two different heads. Okay. So we bring her to zero. We're going to do the same alignment procedure in this orientation because I want to make sure that this is aligned based on that location. So again, I set up my rotation through swivel. I've set up at 180 degree rotation. And we'll bring the head and the indicator over. 
Now, when you start indicating in these types of heads, it's very similar to indicating a vice, right? We've all indicated a vice before. The difference is really how far away from the center pivot point the surface I'm indicating is. So that's important to note. So what you're going to do is you're going to find, and let's go in a little bit more, you're going to find that as you adjust it, you know, your initial reaction is going to be just to move it till you get back to your zero, right? So here I'm going to maybe establish a zero at this far end. All right. So we'll bring it in. She's at zero. Okay, let's see. Right there's zero. Now I'm going to indicate across the bar. Well, I am getting super lucky. Well, there we go. We're, we got about a thou out over the length of this bar. So you would think, oh, okay, I'll just move it till the needle hits a thou. The problem is because of my distance away from center, you actually have to go beyond that. So I would actually move this machine or this head until maybe I was two or three thou beyond and then check it again. And really, again, this is just a behavior of how far away from my center of pivot point. You know, on a vise, you're going to usually be able to get right to the corner of that vise, right where the bolt pivot is. But if you've ever did like a curt vise where the bolt is offset, you start to see this behavior. Okay, so we are zero, everything's straight. We're going to snug her up. Because next, we have to set the tool. Now, if you happen to have the chance to watch part two, or even part one, we talked about setting our joint lengths in place, right? And the joint lengths is what allows this option to compensate for everything. So for me, what I'm expecting when we set up the tool is that I'm going to strictly get a distance from my, basically my collet face out to the tip of the tool. So this is the time when we would want to swap the tool out. We could do this either in the machine or out. And just need a little bit more to pop that collet. Now they do make these types of heads with quick change. Um, so that's another thing if you're doing like multiple operations at the same orientation, then you may want to get yourself something that has a quick change to it. All right, so we snug up this drill. Okay. Tool is now in the spindle. So now we're gonna come and touch this datum. So if I was to take a look and get a quick measurement, you know, it's hard for you guys to see, but if I eyeball this, that's a little shy of an inch and a half that I'm projecting from this collet. So that's really what I'm expecting to see my tool length offset come in at. So we can crank her on up. Good. I'm going to swing the head down to 90 degrees or what the system actually would consider a zero. So we're, we're actually at 90 degrees now, a 90 degree positive orientation. So you swing it down to zero. I would certainly check that scale. Now when you start to bring in, in this case, the zero degrees, because I'm going to zero, you want to make sure this goes in nice and easy. If it doesn't, move it just a little bit. This should not take any effort at all to snug up that orientation. Now I would tighten up these bolts, bolts, especially if I was going to machine in that orientation, but I'm not. I'm just right now coming down to touch the surface. So remember our first step was setting zero, specifically in Z, to the top of the part. So now we're going to bring our tool down. Okay. And we're going to move her down. I'm using the old paper trick just to find and establish this plane. So I want to just move it until it just grabs that piece of paper. Certainly you can see use a shim stock or whatever. But if I look at the display and I look at the work coordinate system, I see I'm sitting at 1.4642. So I buy that. That's about an inch and a half. So the setup, as long as I have the swivel cycle called up, which again was called up through the swivel cycle, and I told it the orientation that I'm in. So my B's at zero. That's telling me I'm straight up and down. We can simply go to measure tool like I normally would. Length manual. 
set the length, and I'm telling it I'm on zero because that's my datum surface. If I was on a little gauge block, I could put that length there. My display zeroes out. Now, if we were to go to the offset table like before, I would see the tools in the spindle, and I have an offset of 1.46. So again, the distance of this projection, and that's what we call a positive tool offset. And that's what also allows me to now rotate this anywhere I want. So we can come in. I would tell it through swivel cycle if I wanted it to track it, but right now is my final orientation, putting the head at 45 degrees, and the head will be fully set up. And I don't have to retouch the tool because of this positive tool offset. Get my old man glasses. All right, so I bring it over. It looks, well, I could use a little more lighting in here. Now I'm going to five degrees, because I'm moving it to 45. And again, I want to just make sure she goes in nice and easy. You'll actually, you can even see the head pulling just a little bit as this detent screw comes in. And then before I start machining, I will go around and tighten up the six perimeter bolts, the three on the front, three on the back, that holds orientation. So now we have a tool that we can bring down to any known datum surface and start to do some machining. Okay, so the tool is set in the system, but what I'd like to do now is I'd really like to come in and show you guys how to write a, write a basic program to handle this. So I'm gonna do the program initially in shop mill, or what we refer to as conversational programming, but after that, we can quickly take a look at it in G-code. So if I transition over, we're going to create our part program. So I go over to my program manager, like I normally would. I go into a folder that I would want to create my part program in. I choose the type of programming method, in this case, shop mill, and I give it some name. So I'll call this demo one. Type in my name, select input or okay, and it starts my shop mill program editor. I have my header page here. So for any of us that have done any shop mill programming, this is pretty straightforward stuff the work coordinate I want to use, what my rough blank would look like for my stock, my basic dimensions. So in our case, our blank is three by three. Top of the part, I'm using zero. Bottom of the part, two inches down. So I fill out the page and I hit accept. Now this is where things get a little different when you start to use the swivel cycle because you're going to establish the orientation with swivel. Now certainly if I had other operations, I wouldn't need the swivel cycle, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna drill that 45 degree hole. So we come over to various, and now we have a button called swivel plane. And the way swivel plane works is I'm going to activate it by hitting the select key, and I should see the name that was set up during the commissioning of the swivel cycle. So this one was called head two, for lack of a better term. Now I'm going to want to do a tool change right now, because it's dependent on this tool when I'm establishing my swivel. So I would go to select tool, find the tool we created, which is the Drill 3 8 AGU-90, say OK, and now I fill out the rest of the swivel cycle. So it asks us, what do I want to do or where do I want to send the head for a safe retract? Remember, this is a man I have this set up as a manual swivel cycle, so it's going to prompt me when I run it in auto to move. So this is a pre-clearance position. And there's a bunch of different ways you could set it. Right now, I commission this one to just be either no to not move, or a full Z going to a safe location. Now, do I want to swivel yes or no? I would typically select yes, I want to actually establish a swivel. And do I want to do a new or an additive swivel? So this works like absolute or incremental programming. So we want to do a new. Now, I can shift the system around or the zero around with these first three areas, the X0, Y0, Z0. So what it's going to allow me to do, it's going to allow me to move my coordinate system. And if you look at your basic part, right now, this is our X, Y, and Z zero, right? It's dead center of the part. So what I want to do is I'm going to want to shift my zero over to the corner of this part, because I know from this theoretical corner to the surface was half an inch. And then from there, I also know that this drill depth is going to be another half an inch deep. So we're shifting the part zero with this first set of fields. 
After that, we're going to go in and we're going to establish a rotation. So I shifted a half inch and a half. So remember, half of my block over. I'm not shifting the Y or Z. They can stay alone. Now I choose a strategy of rotation. So I can do what we call kinematic independent rotations, which is an angular value about a linear axis. And here I'm moving this cube around as if you can see it. <laughs> I didn't change the frame. Or I can do direct axis. So either one would work. Now I was using direct out inside of um, jog mode, but I can also use axis by axis. So in this case, I'm telling the system that I'm rotating the coordinate system about my y-axis of negative 45 degrees. And this is what we refer to as kinematic independent part program. Kind of a big fancy term, but basically it means that this program could theoretically run on any machine tool. Not, it wouldn't be dependent on having a C and a B axes commissioned. Now finally, when I'm almost all said and done, I can also do a shift. So if we go back to our previous view, if I can visualize it, my coordinate system is now sitting up here in the air. Oops, I didn't get a screen change. There we go. So my coordinate system is sitting up here in the air. So it's really off the surface by a half an inch. So if I want to, I can shift my zero down with the x1, y1, z1 fields. So I'm going to shift my z, negative a half inch, that's placing the zero on this surface that I would have said I maybe pre-machined in this case. So that's why we have a negative 0.5 there. Select accept, and now my orientation is created, it's established. So at this point, now we can go in and we can actually give it some toolpath. So just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to go and I'm going to drill a basic hole. I do, need not, do not need to, excuse me, do not need to refill out the tool because it already knows it from the previous event. Let's give it some feed, some spindle speed. How do I want to compensate for my drilling? tip or calculate the tip projection. And then how far down do I want to drill absolute? So this is now relative to that new plane we established. And I'm moving a half an inch in Z. And that's the beauty of this cycle. I manipulated Z, so now I can do any standard CAN cycle and they'll all work in any orientation angles. I'm not doing anything fancy here. This is, this is a basic drilling cycle. But it's a basic drilling cycle that is now being manipulated by the swivel cycle, or what we talked about, cycle 800. So I save the drilling cycle. I then just go and tell it where I want to drill. In our case, it's super easy. I'm just drilling at 0, 0. Now, if I wanted to feed from a larger plane, I could maybe use a positive value there. Now, with any type of modal cycle, if I turn it on, I want to make sure I turn it back off. So when I'm done with it, I would want to go to various, want to go to swivel plane, want to reselect the name, what we call our tool carrier, that's what the TC there means, to zero. I can let it send the machine to a safe retract position. And really now I have a written part program. So if we look at it in simulation, it's going to be super exciting because it's going to drill a hole. But at the end of the day, it's going to drill a hole at this orientation angle we just established. So we'll go into maybe a 3D view. And we should see a drill come right over there. First it prompted me to set my tool angle. And there we see we've drilled the hole. But more importantly, why don't we take a look at the real action shot and let's run this brand new program we just created. So I'm going to go over to execute to load a program into memory. We're going to hit cycle start. Now, obviously, whenever we're running a machine, safety first. So I want safety glasses, override down at zero, cycle start. We can now give her a little bit of gas. She's going to a safe retract location. Prompts me the angle that I would want to set the head at. I've already preset it, so I can just hit cycle start. And let's make sure you guys get enough of a view here. Yeah, it looks pretty good. All right, so now it's coming into position. You see how it's moving normal to the surface? Because that's my Z plane now. It's relative to that surface. So she comes in, and now I'm feeding relative to this inclined plane. So you can now start to use any of your CAN cycles. There's your safety retract at the end of the part program. 
Safety retract is just prompting me to send it back to zero, zero. Cycle start and I can either continue on with another operation or take the head out, do something different, or in the program if this was the basic part program. So the final thing I wanted to show you guys, I know there's a lot of you guys out there use CAD CAM systems, programming in G-code. So the exact same process can happen if you were to write it in G-code. Now, what's important, and I neglected to tell you earlier, is when you go to define your spindle direction, a lot of times these heads use planetary gears, so you have to tell it the direction is actually opposite. So in the offset table for shop mill, I control that with this clockwise, counterclockwise symbol, so I want to run everything in counterclockwise. In my G-code, it's completely dependent to the M3, M4 commands. So if I was to take a look at the G-code program, this would be a very typical G-code program. I have a safety line. I have a workpiece blank that sets up just the graphics. I load my tool, do my tool change, make sure my offset's loaded, set up my spindles. This is all straight G-code. But you notice I'm programming an M4 now, not an M3. So my spindle rotates the right direction for this head, this spindle. But now what I'm going to do is, under the same location, various and swivel plane, I now build what we call our cycle 800. And that's just really the G-code name for the swivel cycle. Same exact parameters like you just put there. The only difference is there's no tool field, because I've already done a tool change, and I'm in G-code. So we can just say accept to it. I can now move the machine around in position, just wrapping around. But again, remembering my Z is now normal to that surface. We can use all our standard drilling cycles. So here's a cycle 82. Tell it where I want to drill. And when it comes time to cancel it, I just do a cycle 800 open close parentheses, and that will cancel the cycle. I can then send her to some kind of safe location for the end of my program. I can use a super command, very common. Here I'm using a G75 reference return. And there we're done. So we can simulate that and we should see the exact same type of part program and then certainly we could go and run that program as well and we would get the same desired toolpath. So whether you're doing straight CAD CAM G code or shop mill shop floor type programming you can still use the exact same functionality to now manage your orientation of your swivel cycle. So with that being said I hope you guys enjoyed this three-part series. You know, I wanted to get a chance to go a little deeper, and I think we did. Um, if you guys have any questions, certainly you can always reach out to me um, right through the Mr. CNC YouTube channel. And with that being said, please, again, remember to like it and share these events and share these videos. And keep an eye out for us because we're going to come back to you really soon. So have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you guys.